Your soldier's heart almost stood still as he watched those sons of Aaron fearlessly rush to their death. The brilliant assault on Mari's Heights of the Irish Brigade was beyond description. Why, my darling, we forgot they were fighting us, and cheered after cheer at their fearlessness went up all along our lines. George Pickett, December 13th, 1862. Welcome, friends. So this will be uh, part of our Gettysburg series, and uh, if there's one thing you figured about me so far, I am Irish from descent, though I am an American, and this gives me a close relation to the subject of today's video. The 69th New York, 28th Massachusetts, 88th New York, 63rd New York, and 116th Pennsylvania. Those all sound like random regiments, but those were the regiments that made up the 2nd Brigade, 1st Division of the 2nd Corps of the Army of the Potomac, better known as the Irish Brigade. A brigade primarily made up of men from the Isle of Arran, so to speak, who wanted to prove to their new adopted nation their love and loyalty. The story of the Irish Brigade doesn't start in September of 1861. It begins in 1848, following the failure of the Young Irelander Rebellion. This was a rising that was, in a way, caused directly by the British government failing to assist Ireland and even blaming ministers such as Robert Peel, the Prime Minister, Charles Trevelyan, Minister of Ireland, and the Prime Minister to follow, Mr. Peel, John Russell, for the anguish of the Irish people who had been suffering from the potato famine or blight. The British government will end this rebellion and deport, execute, and make examples of the leaders. This is where we meet Thomas Francis Marr. He was a revolutionary who has actually created what we today know as the Irish flag. He and his fellow leaders, Michael Doyney, James Houston, and Richard O'Gorman, convinced the state of New York to let them create a militia regiment of strictly Irish volunteers sponsored by the state. The plan was actually to make a few regiments and use their training and skill to return to Ireland again and fight the fight. So that would make Marr create the 69th New York State Militia. Doyeny would create the 7th New York Militia, later to be called the Republican Rifles. But, all these, but of all these units, the 69th would rise to prominence in the 1850s when nativist organizations feared the full Irish Catholic unit would adhere to the Pope of Rome and threaten the people of New York, causing much violence, which in fact did the opposite of its intentions. Instead of disbanding the unit, the stars, the state of New York supported the regiment. However, in 1860, the regiment would gain infamy. Across the United States, when Queen Victoria's son, the Prince of Wales, Albert, would go on an American tour and the now colonel of the brigade, of the regiment, Michael Cochran, refused to parade the regiment for the prince. Cochran would be arrested for this, but then all charges would be dropped later that year. This was when rebel troops had fired on Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor in South Carolina. The 69th was immediately summoned to suppress the rebellion in the cotton states. They would see their first action at the Battle of Bull Run or First Manassas, July 21st, 1861. Marr would have to take command soon after due to the fact that Colonel Cochran was uh, captured by Southern soldiers. Marr would then plead to War Department under Simon Cameron and even President Lincoln himself for permission to return to New York and raise an entire brigade of Irishmen to serve and fight for the Union cause. 
he would be granted this, returning to New York City, cheered as a hero with his regiment, who had already gained fame as one of the only units to not completely run off the field. He would lecture and speak across Manhattan and the boroughs to the city to convince Irishmen to join the Union cause. In September of 1861, two more regiments would join the 69th and 63rd New York, commanded by Colonel Richard e. C. Enright of County Limerick, then the 88th New York, commanded by Colonel Henry Baker of County Waterford. The 88th would actually be gifted their colors from now General Marr's wife, which earned them the name Mrs. Marr's own. All three regiments would muster out of Fort Schuyler in New York Harbor and then be sent to Washington, D.C., and the 29th Massachusetts would be added to their brigade. The 29th was not what we would call a Fenian regiment. Fenian was a term to refer to the Irish Republican Brotherhood, an organization that would actually later on in the 20th century get Irish independence. The brigade was now the 2nd Brigade, 1st Division, commanded by General Israel Richardson, in General Edwin Summers, Sumner's 2nd Union Corps. They will see their first action during the Peninsula Campaign, specifically at the Battle of Fair Oaks, June 1, 1861, when they gained national rec recognition for gallantry. The Peninsula, however, would end with Confederate victory, George McClellan having abandoned his push for Richmond. Next, they would see action at the Battle of Seven Days, where again, McClellan will be defeated but now by the new commander of the Army of Northern Virginia, Robert E. Lee. In summer to fall of 1862, Lee made an ambitious invasion of the North, McClellan meeting him near a small town named Sharpsburg, but the battle is more remembered for the small creek that passed by it, Antietam, on September 17, 1862. The 1st Division was given a suicidal objective. They were to hit the right flank of the southern position, which would hopefully chase the Southerners back across the river. General Richardson commanded Marr and his Irish forward, knowing the fear the brigade put in the hearts of many Southern units. Marr on horseback led his brigade forward while one of the regimental chaplains blessed the brigade with absolution, the Catholic right before death and forgiveness of earthly sin. An Irish woman had found her way to the field as well and was chanting, God bless the Irish, and Faha Blah, the, the brigade's chant, which was Irish for clear the way. The objective was to clear a road called the Sunken Road, a road between two elevated areas of earth. The Confederates under G.B. Anderson was commanding. Marr was not aware of what the position was actually. It was pretty much an entrenched position that the Irish were making a full frontal assault on. But even while being continued fired on from a better position, enemy, the Irish stood there, stood there returning fire. The next brigade to come in was General Caldwell's brigade, but they had not moved forward. General Richardson, who had only sent the Irish forward knowing they would be supported, wrote to General Caldwell's brigade demanding to know where the general was. Um, this is a subject of great debate with many historians some believe that general caldwell had been watching what was happening to the irish and was actually afraid to move forward and was hiding behind a hay bale nearby others believe the general had coincidentally become ill before the fighting and became incapacitated regardless though general richardson ordered the brigade forward to relieve the irish as the fighting continued general french's division arrived to support richardson's assault the Irish at this point had lost 60% of their men, including General Marr, whose horse was shot out from under him, crushing his leg. Again, much like Caldwell's hiding, it's debated that General Marr was drunk and fell. But most eyewitnesses did support General Marr's horse being shot out and crushing his leg. The Irish would be sent back to recover, General Marr also being carried off the field. General Richardson would later be wounded in the day wounded and command of the division given to general winfield scott hancock the war department had also at this time signed two new regiments to the brigade both made up of irish immigrants the 28th massachusetts commanded by colonel richard burns of county cavan 
would replace the 29th Massachusetts and the 116th Pennsylvania, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel St. Clair Augustine Mahalan from County Antrim, bolstering the brigade to 1,200 men. The new commander of the Army of the Potomac, Ambrose Burnside, prepared to make his push for the Confederate capital of Richmond. He would catch the Southerners by surprise, crossing at Fredericksburg, Virginia, then march on Richmond. But there was one flaw. The bridges of Fredericksburg were destroyed, so he had to wait for pontoon bridges to arrive from Washington. This was the first mistake, because at this point, the Army of Northern Virginia discovered the strategy. So Lee commanded his two Grand Corps to converge on the town of Fredericksburg. Hancock spoke to his commander, Darius Couch, warning they must cross the river now or the Southerners will take advantage. When the opinion was voiced to Couch's superiors, Sumner and Burnside, they refused to believe the Southerners had taken the initiative. So on December 11th, 1862, what became known as the Second Waterloo began. After fighting across the river, Union troops had taken the town of Fredericksburg, but Confederate troops were entrenched at the heights beyond the town, called Maury's Heights. Now, this is where I need to discuss what makes this situation beyond sad. Hancock will send his division up a frontal assault of the heights commanded by Burnside on December 13th, 1862. Waiting on top of the heights were the 24th Georgia under the command of Confederate General Cobb. The 24th was primarily made up of Irish immigrants coming out of Savannah and New Orleans, including on their regimental flag, the Harp of Erin. Now, the field between the town of Fredericksburg and Maury's Heights were actually cornfields. So at 12.30 p.m., General Marr, who was still struggling from complications of his wound at Antietam, ordered what was now the fifth assault at the Heights. All across the field, men of both sides looked on in awe and admiration as the Irish made their charge, keeping their composure and formation together. The 24th immediately began to fire into their fellow Irishmen. Even as the Irish got closest to the walls of Mari's Heights, Lear, fearful the Fenian connection, sent reserves to help Cobb, but they were unnecessary. With tears in their eyes, the 24th Georgia fired into their brothers. The Irish Brigade stood their ground as they were being shot from all directions. Quickly, other Confederate units began to cry at the sight of the Irish killing themselves in another nation's war. At last, after taking too many casualties, the Irish Brigade broke, with it the heart of the army. Now, before I mentioned cornfields they were fighting on. In 1846 to 1849, the United States wanted to give aid to the Irish who were suffering through the famine. So many landowners in southern states gave much of their harvest to Irish relief. Many of the owners of the plantations and farms cried, realizing many of the dead Irish on the field possibly were fed by the very same field they now lay dead in. Of the 1,200 Irish who made the charge, about 280 were at the roll call the next day. The army at the disaster of Fredericksburg would settle into winter quarters in Virginia, as did the Confederates. Marr again requested to return to New York, Philadelphia, Boston, and other northern cities to recruit more Irishmen to rebuild this, his brigade that at one time had 4,000 men. But President Lincoln's new Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, denied the request. It is not known why he denied it. Some say it was anti-Irish bias. Others say he was uh, sick of certain units getting special treatment over others. And others think it's because Stanton believed the rumors of Mars alcoholism. The Irish Brigade would serve again during the Battle of Chancellorsville in the spring of 1863. After Chancellorsville, Mar put in his resignation which set of which put Colonel Patrick Kelly of the 88th New York to be promoted as command of the brigade. Moore's resignation was actually denied, and he was sent to the Western Theater. Then, when the war ended, he was made the governor of Montana Territory in 1865, and would cease being it in 1866. 
1867, he would disappear on a riverboat carrying supplies for federal troops. No one knows what happened to him. Some believed he was murdered, others that he ran away. But the sad reality is, after the war, he had taken to drinking to numb his undiagnosed PTSD. And it is strongly believed he just fell off the riverboat while being drunk. Under Patrick Kelly, the Irish Brigade will fight at Gettysburg in the delaying action on the second day. They would serve throughout the rest of the war, Colonel Kelly being killed at the Siege of Petersburg, Virginia in 1864. Following this, the brigade was finally disbanded and what remained of the brigade was added to the 1st Division of the 2nd Corps. Early in 1865, an attempt was made to recreate the brigade, a second Irish brigade, with all the same units as well as the 4th New York Artillery, which had been defending Washington throughout the war. But the Supreme Commander of All Armies, Grant, had ordered the capital's garrisons redeployed with the army. The Irish Brigade was survived by the New York 69th Regiment, which remains an active unit even today. Actually, a dear friend of mine is a corporal in the regiment. Its name, the Fighting 69th, was in fact given to them from none other than Robert E. Lee. Also, the University of Notre Dame in Indiana continues the tradition of the Irish Brigade. The chaplain of the 88th New York, Father William Corby, would go on to become the third president of Notre Dame University. He would often tell of giving absolution to his dear Irish brigade. And then he delivered ap- and when he delivered absolution to the brigade at the Battle of Gettysburg, he yelled to them as they marched off, Now go get them, my fighting Irish. The tale not only became tradition at Notre Dame, but it became their motto and mascot of the fighting Irishman leprechaun. He looks very similar to Father Corby during his tenure as the brigade's chaplain. The legacy of the Irish Brigade is one of men who came to a nation of people who hated them for their religious beliefs, but did not allow them to stop them from proving their worth to this nation. They became a beloved household name. Men bought veterans drinks. Cities honored them. Even President John F. Kennedy in June 1963 Almost a hundred years since the Battle of Gettysburg, he gifted the Irish doll Neherin and the people of Ireland the flags of the Irish Brigade, bringing, at least in spirits, the sons of Ireland home at last. Thanks for watching. Like I said, this is just the beginning of our series on Gettysburg and units and the commanders and events. Tomorrow we'll be discussing someone whose name is tied to Gettysburg, Virginia Wade, or as we better know her, Jenny Wade. Thanks for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you real soon.